Last week we started on, or we covered wired media, and we started on wireless media or unguided media, and we finished talking about antennas. And we'll recap and cover again this relationship between an isotropic antenna, which is not a real antenna. An isotropic antenna we think is a, uh, an ideal antenna, something in theory. Our real antennas are not perfect in that they propagate their signal uh, at different energy levels in different directions. And we compare a real antenna compared uh, to an isotropic antenna using the antenna gain. We'll come back and explain the antenna gain again, but before we do so, we'll look at some other parts of our wireless transmission. This is a simple transmission model for when we send wireless signals. We have a transmitter. The antenna generates some electromagnetic waves. They propagate across the air and are received by a receive antenna, and hence we have received the signal. Let's look at the impairments as the signal propagates across the air. In particular, how far can it propagate such that we can receive it? We know that we send any signal, wired, wireless, we start with some power level, some signal strength, it gets weaker across distance. So as the signal travels some distance, whether it's across a cable or across air, the signal strength or the power gets weaker and weaker. It attenuates. Okay? We're going to look at by how much does it attenuate. So we're going to skip through some slides in here to get to that, and then we'll return to antenna gains. We're going to talk about power levels. That is, we transmit a signal at some power level, measured in watts, and that signal passes through the air, and at the receiver, it's received at some power level, which will be less than the transmitted power level, because we lose power, it attenuates. So often we refer to, okay, Transmitted power level, PT, the subscript T for transmit, and PR for the received power level. We'd like to know, if I transmit at some power level, one watt, and my signal needs to travel one kilometre, what power level is it received at? That's one useful thing to design. Where should I locate my antennas, my transmit and receive stations, so that I can communicate? How much power do I lose between transmitter and receiver? What is the loss? So we often relate. Well, the other factor we introduce is the loss, L. Use the L to indicate the loss of the signal strength that we lose between transmitter and receiver. So we're going to relate these factors together. What impacts upon how much power is lost between transmitter and receiver? So we'll skip through, we'll come back to antennas slightly later. Well, our signal that propagates between transmitter and receiver, the impairment on that signal, the amount of signal strength it loses, and how it propagates depends upon the frequency of that signal. Here are three uh, categories of different types of frequencies, starting from below 2, milli two megahertz, and between 2 and 30 megahertz approximately, and above 30 megahertz. We can differentiate signals at those frequencies into these three different groups, and they have different characteristics or different properties in how they propagate. And they're best shown on this diagram. The signals below 2 megahertz we refer to as ground wave propagation. And the way that the signals propagate uh, effectively follow the contour of the Earth. So we think we have two stations somewhere on the Earth. The Earth is a sphere, so in two dimensions we see this arc here. Signals at these less than 2 megahertz effectively follow around the curvature of the Earth. Why? Well, the way that which the signals uh, refract or are refracted by different uh, uh, things in the atmosphere, by the 
uh, yeah, the atmosphere, the, and we'll see later the ionosphere, and with if we've got a lower frequency, it will follow the Earth as we transmit it around. Of course, the signal gets weaker across distance, but the direction in which it travels follows around the Earth. And this is used in what's often referred to as shortwave radio. You get a, a shortwave radio, and you can listen to radio, radio stations which are transmitted from the other side of the world or most way around the world because at those lower frequencies the signal will follow the curvature of the earth and we'll be able to receive those signals assuming it's transmitted at a high enough strength these diagrams do not show that we still lose signal strength they're just showing how the signal propagates signals between 2 and 30 megahertz effectively bounce off the ionosphere and the ground. So we see here's the Earth, here's the ionosphere, the signals, if we transmit it, and they bounce off and we can receive them. Again, some way around the Earth. Whereas above 30 megahertz, we have what's called line of sight propagation. To be able to receive a signal, the receiver needs to be able to see the transmitter. So, of course, by C, we, if we have a transmitter here and one here, we cannot send the signal through the Earth. They cannot see each other because of the curvature of the Earth. So here we need line of sight in order to be able to communicate because the signals are not, propaga or are not bouncing off the ionosphere and the Earth. Uh, they're not low enough to follow the uh, Earth's curvature. They, need, they effectively go straight and therefore to be able to receive it the receiver needs to be able to see if you stood at the receiver you'd be able to see if you could see far enough you'd be able to see the transmitter so if you go too far around the earth you will not receive that signal so depending upon the frequency our signals propagate in different ways of course, we can see the benefits of the first two in that we can cover a potentially larger distance because, in theory, we could go all the way around the Earth. So long as we transmit our signal with a strong enough power, such that the received power is large enough. But with frequencies, uh, signals with frequencies above 30 megahertz, then we're restricted by line of sight communication we cannot send all the way around the Earth because the Earth is round. Okay. Some of that, uh, those characteristics are summarized in this table, in this column on propagation characteristics, ground wave, um, sky wave propagation, SW, and line of sight, and LOS. These are some common names of the frequency ranges, different bands. We mentioned last week we have VHF, UHF, low frequency, voice frequency and others. Just some common names given to these approximate frequency ranges. The wavelength of those signals, some characteristics you see in here, uh, depending upon the frequency they are impacted by different um, things in the atmosphere. Rain it may attenuate some signals more than others. Uh, and in the last column some typical use cases for those different frequencies we see AM radio broadcasting VHF TV UHF TV, FM radio uh, infrared down here so when we get the very high frequencies visible light for optical communications satellite communications and so on so some examples applications of different frequency bands so when we choose, yeah? yes, you have an exam next Tuesday and you need to memorize this table. No, 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 no. Okay, we just, we just, uh, you don't have to rem remember the individual frequencies or even of the bands. We're just giving some examples. Uh, for example, if I gave you this table in the exam, 
you may be able to answer some questions about, okay, uh, what's an advantage of line of sight, or what's an advantage of ground wave versus line of sight? Okay, all right. Ground wave, you can transmit further around the Earth. Line of sight, you're restricted by having line of sight. What is the distance of the line of sight? It depends, well, you could calculate, I don't know what it is, but it depends upon the curvature of the Earth. Okay? You know how big the Earth is. You know the curvature of the Earth. It depends then on how high you place your antennas, your transmit and receive antenna. The higher you place it, if you place them up here, you can spread them out further and still get line of sight. So it can be calculated. Similar, how far can you see? Say you had binoculars, how far can you see if the ground is flat, no mountains or trees? Well, uh, it depends upon the curvature of the Earth. You cannot see something which is too far away because the cur Earth curves around and you will not be able to see that. So that's the same principle there. I don't know the answer of how far it is. So no, we're quickly going through this, not for you to uh, understand all the details here, but just to give you some examples of the different frequency bands uh, and the differences between them. The important point is that when you choose a technology, and in particular you choose a wireless technology, you normally need to select the frequency of the signal. Okay, whether it's uh, in, what, in one of these bands, whether it's 2.4 gigahertz, whether it's 900 megahertz, or some other frequency. One thing to know is that the frequency impacts upon how your signal will propagate. How far it will propagate, what obstacles it will propagate through. Will it be impeded by water? When it rains, the signal gets weaker. Will it pass through walls? Laser or infrared will not. Uh, different frequencies will pass through walls, but with some attenuation. So, what impairs our signal? When we transmit the signal, it starts with some strength and it gets weaker across distance. By how much weaker, or by how much does it get weaker? That's one thing we'd, we'd like to know. Well, first we have what's called free space loss. If we have no other, Im no other um, obstacles, there's, we're out in uh, free space, out in space, or in a vacuum, then our signal energy dissipates as we transmit it, and it gets weaker, and there's an equation which we'll see shortly that shows the relationship between the transmit power, receive power, and the distance at which we travel. That is, how much power do we lose across particular, uh, particular distance? So we lose power according to a free space path loss model. But we do not operate in a perfect vacuum. We do not send signals, or we're not commonly sending signals out in space. We have other atmosphere, atmospheric uh, um, obstacles, so absorption in the atmosphere. We have water in the atmosphere and oxygen. oxygen. They also attenuate signals. So our signals do not, may not pass through water very easily. So you imagine there's a droplet of water. The signal is propagating. It hits that droplet of water. And when it comes out the other side, it's, it's weaker because the water attenuates that signal. So the amount at which water and rain will attenuate a signal depends upon the frequency and, of course, the amount of water, water vapor present. Just another factor that reduces our signal strength. Signals propagate off different obstacles and effectively bounce off different obstacles such that we can have interference from signals from different frequency components, so multipath signals. An example is shown here where here we have a transmitter on the ground and a receiver. We transmit 
And remember, our signals are made up of, in fact, different frequency components. It's a range of frequencies. It's not one, one precise frequency. It's a range of frequencies. And even though those frequencies are very close, they propagate slightly differently. So what may happen is some parts of the signal are received directly. Other parts may go in a slightly different direction and maybe bounce off the ground in this case and be received. This may cause problems because they're received at different times at the receiver. The propagation delay differs slightly because they travel a different distance. A worst case is when you're on a mobile phone, especially in a car. Here's your car. Here's the cell phone tower. You're inside the car talking on your phone. It's the cell phone tower, the mobile phone tower is transmitting a signal in, say, in this general direction. You want to receive it. You're inside the car. The signal propagates in these different directions. You receive it, the signal here directly, but the signal also propagates in this direction and bounces off a building. And you receive the signal bounced off the building and another building. You receive the signal from multiple sources at different times because they travel different distances. And that can cause interference at the receiver and difficulties in receiving the data because if you're receiving multiple copies of the signal at different times, they interfere with each other and effectively create noise and make it harder to receive the data. That is more bit errors. So there are different factors that impact upon uh, how well the signal is received by the receiver. We always lose signal strength, whether it, uh, so in, that's free space path loss, we lose signal strength. We may have lose signal strength due to the atmosphere. We may have interference due to signals bouncing off different obstacles, multipath interference, or refraction through the atmosphere is another factor. So there are different factors that impact upon how well we receive our signal. We're not going to go through the last three in any detail or any more detail, but we will go through the first one and relate. If we transmit at some power level, PT, over some distance, we'll see that there's some path loss. Some power is lost across the path. By how much? Because that impacts upon what our received power is. The received power is the transmit power minus the amount which we lose, the loss. In free space, when in a perfect vacuum, for example, the path, there's an equation for how much power we lose. And we'll see it here, but we'll uh, explain it slightly differently first. That is, uh, originally, uh, Friss come up with an equation which, in the perfect environment, how much power do we lose versus distance? And that is used in the free space path loss model. It's a model, a mathematical model, for working out how much power do we lose. Uh, how can we write this? Before we explain the model, let's generalize it a little bit more. What we could say is the receive power is the transmit power divided by some loss factor, L. For example, if I transmit at one watt and I do some measurements and between my transmitter and receiver, I transmit here and my receiver here, PR, I do some measurements and I measure, I know how much power I transmit with, I measure how much I receive with, and I measure the loss, that is the, the ratio of the uh, transmit to receive power. And if I measure the loss, for example, to be a factor of two, that means 
the received power equals a half of the transmit power. So here L is an absolute uh, value, a factor or a ratio, or used in a ratio. That is, a loss of 2 means we start with some transmit power, the received power is a half of the transmit power. We get weaker. A gain of 2 means it would be double. A loss is the opposite here. So we can generally express the received power as the transmit power divided by the loss factor. All using absolute values. We're not talking about decibels here. In fact, and we need to come back to it later, with that's true with isotropic antennas. Okay? And Friss come up with some analysis, I think that's how you pronounce his name, that says with isotropic antennas, what is the loss factor? And what do we get? It's not on the slide. It's the loss factor is 4 times pi times the distance between transmitter and receiver, all squared, divided by the wavelength of the signal squared. So I know the distance, if we know the distance between transmitter and receiver, the distance here, D, and if I know the frequency of the signal that I'm sending, okay, I know the frequency, with the frequency I can find the wavelength, because we know the wavelength equals the speed of light divided by the frequency. I know the speed of light C. If I know the frequency of my signal, I can find the wavelength. And the relationship between the, well, the loss factor between our transmitter and receiver is calculated as 4 times pi times d all squared divided by the wavelength squared. That tells us how much signal do we lose in free space in a perfect environment. No other uh, atmospheric effects. No other obstacles. We'll see where that comes into the equation on the slide, but uh, let's check if it's correct shortly. This assumes our antennas are isotropic the perfect antennas. But we know that with real antennas, with directional antennas, we can get some gain of our antenna. Thus, we can think they are stronger than an isotropic antenna. We'll come back to the explanation of the antenna gain, but in fact we can express the antenna gain as some, again, as some factor. How much stronger compared to an isotropic antenna. For example, if we have our transmitter, we have an antenna, and I'll draw it again, but slightly different. We have an antenna. And a receive antenna. Then we transmit with some power PT. We receive with some power PR. The transmit antenna has a gain. Some factor that it's uh, better than an isotropic antenna. We express that as GT. If a gain, if GT was 2, then we'd say that that antenna is twice as strong as an isotropic antenna, a factor of 2. Similar, a receive antenna has some gain. We say GR. So we can include the gains into the relationship between the transmit and receive power. The loss factor is still the same. The loss is what we lose between the antennas. 
So the signal comes out of the first antenna and it loses signal strength before it's received by the receive antenna. How much does it lose? It's expressed by this equation. Depends upon the distance and the wavelength. So now we can put them all together and say, okay, what we had before was PR was equals PT over loss. That's if we used isotropic antennas. But using real antennas, we have some gain. We'd express PR equals PT. The gain increases the received signal strength. If we look at our diagram here, the signal received power is going to be larger if the gain is going to be larger. A gain will increase our power. So if we have a high gain, the power will increase and therefore the received power will increase. The gains increase the signal strength. So the receive power, in fact, equals the transmit power times by the gain of the transmit antenna, the gain of the receive antenna, divided by the loss. We start with a transmit power. The transmit antenna increases the power, a multiplier. The receive antenna will increase the power, also a multiplier. But between the two antennas, we lose power. So we, by how much? By a factor of L. So we have a divider here. And now we can substitute in L and we get PR equals PT GT GR times lambda squared over 4 pi D all squared. And we can rearrange it and you get the equation on the slide. We just, it's just rearranged here. We, if we move PR here and multiply, we get the same as on the board. So that's, this is the more common form that you'll see the free space path loss model. Where L, the path loss, is 4 pi d all squared divided by lambda squared. PT is the transmit power, GT and GR are the gains of the transmit and receive antennas respectively. So yep. In this case, loss is only that much. Yes, loss is this 4 pi d over all squared over lambda squared. That's the loss of our signal strength through the air or through free space in, in particular. But then PT uh, L, in our case, is the loss between the two antennas. When we talk about a loss or gain, we talk about relative to some point. Uh, we could alternatively look at, okay, what's the loss between, if we ignore the antennas, we can talk about the loss through the system. So the loss here is between coming out of one antenna and going into one antenna. That's what L is. Another way we could look at it is, well, what's the loss? Here's our computer. We need to transmit a signal across some cables. We also lose power. What's the loss between here and the receiving computer? We could do that. When we talk about a loss or a gain, it's between two points. In the free space path loss model, L, the loss, is between our transmit antenna and receive antenna, by definition. We use that to work out or to approximate how far we can transmit some signal, which is important. Any other questions on how I come up with this? The equation for L, 4 pi d all squared over lambda squared, is, is a given. It was, was calculated by Friss, uh, and it happens, or it occurs in free space, in a perfect vacuum, if we have no obstacles, no atmospheric effects. The gains are gains of real antennas relative to isotropic antennas.
This is a model of path loss, a mathematical equation that allows us to calculate. It's not realistic. We do not operate in free space. We do not send our signals from my laptop to the access point in free space or in a vacuum. We're in, there's some atmospheric effects and there may be some obstacles. So in real life, the loss may be different from what's given by this equation. We either measure it, we use some device to measure the transmit power of my laptop and the receive power of the uh, access point and we can calculate the loss. But of course we cannot do that very easily. Sometimes when we design a network we'd like to be able to plan and, and determine in advance what is the loss going to be in this building, for example. The free space path loss uh, equation is one model. The, uh, the simplest model but assumes we're working in free space, out in space or we're in a vacuum. There are other models that people have come up with which are more specific. For example, models which work inside cities. They take into account that our signals do not pass through buildings very well and they reflect off buildings. So that also impacts upon our path loss. And there's models that are applied for TV broadcast. In TV broadcast, there's a TV station, has a tower, they send a signal and people with their antennas on their, uh, in their homes, on the TVs in the homes, can receive the signal. There are models to work out how far can we transmit our TV signal. So the TV station can use that to work out where to place the transmit tower to reach the most people and what transmit power to transmit at. So there are other models. We either measure to get the real value or we use some mathematical model to predict what it could be. But the models make some assumptions which are not always true. Let's... Before we come back to the antenna game, let's do a quick calculation. Actually, no, for this one we need the antenna game, sorry. We need to go back now. And then we'll go through the example. So, in free space, the path loss, or the receive power, depends upon the path loss, L, the transmit power, and the gains of the antennas. Let's try and explain again about what is the gain of an antenna. We said last week that there's this perfect antenna. A perfect antenna is called an isotropic antenna. And it, when it transmits a signal, the energy coming out of that antenna propagates in all directions equally. So if the transmitter is here, if you measure the received signal one meter in front of it and measure the received signal one meter behind it, they'll be the same. And if you measure one meter above and below, they'll also all be the same. So you can think the one meter away from that transmitter, the received signal, no matter what point you measure it at, will be the same. That's our perfect isotropic antenna. The power propagates in all directions. We think we have a sphere around the transmitter. Our real antennas, are, we cannot manufacture a perfect isotropic antenna. We uh, can get close, uh, but in many cases we'd like to shape the signal to go in a particular direction. We don't want to transmit equally in all directions. We use directional antennas. A special case of a directional antenna is an omnidirectional antenna. This one which, if we have a transmitter here, it transmits equally in this direction, in one plane, say in the horizontal plane, forward, back, left and right, but weaker going up and down. We sort of get some donut that goes around the, the transmitter. That's what these are, are commonly, these access points are omnidirectional antennas. Or generally a directional antenna where Instead of transmitting our power equally in all directions, 
in one direction, or in some directions, the power is concentrated, it's stronger. In the other directions, it's weaker. So we concentrate the energy in a particular direction. As a result, if we compare a real antenna, which concentrates the power in one direction, to an isotropic antenna, which spreads the power in all directions equally, then we can measure the ratio between the two and we get an antenna gain. I tried to illustrate it last week, we'll try again but with a different picture. And you don't have this one, but just try and follow along. Let's say this is my isotropic antenna, the black dot in the middle. That's the location. Of course we need to draw in just two dimensions here, we cannot draw three dimensions easily. I transmit with some power level called PT from my isotropic antenna. And let's say I measure one meter away from the transmitter and I measure the power to be PR. And in all directions, one meter away, we get the same power level. So the outer circle, at any point on that circle, the power level will be PR, some value PR. Of course, if I'm two meters away, it will be a different value. It will be weaker than PR. The further we go away from the transmitter, the weaker the signal gets. We know that here. The larger D gets, the distance between transmitter and receiver, the larger the loss. So our signal gets weaker across distance. If we transmit with some power PT, then the black circle on the outside shows at uh, all those points the received power will be the same value PR. I measure here, we get PR. I measure here, it's PR. All these points, PR. That's our isotropic antenna. Now consider a directional antenna. And it's not the best picture, but uh, Say this directional antenna is designed such that the power is concentrated in this direction. Think of this circle and it's been squished. You've squeezed in this part of the circle and it goes out here and of course it comes in at this side. And we think of this blue shape as the... Uh, indicates the design of the in this case a directional antenna, a different, a real antenna. How we interpret this blue shape is that, okay, the same location of the transmitter, every point on this blue line, if we measure the power, we get PR. The same PR as on the black line. If PR was, say, one watt, the value was one watt, then one meter away from our isotropic antenna, we measure here, it's one watt receive power, one watt, one watt, and so on. With our different directional antenna, we measure at this point, which is more than one meter away, maybe 1.2 meters away, the receive power is PR, or one watt. If we measure here, it's also PR, for example, one watt. But of course it's further away from the transmitter, the distance is larger. And all these points on this blue uh, shape, the received power is PR. If we measure here, which is about half a metre from the transmitter, we get PR. Focusing on in, in this direction, it's a directional antenna, we're concentrating the energy in this direction. If we measure now, for our directional antenna, the power strength at this point, this red point, which is one meter away from the transmitter. What is the power level for our isotropic antenna at that red point? What's the value? at the, that red point, what's the value of the received power for our isotropic antenna? 
uh, all right, we said an example, one watt, or generally PR. One watt was just an example, but let's say for the isotropic antenna at that red point, or one meter away from the transmitter, we get a power of PR. Now, for our directional antenna, at that same point, which is also one meter away from the transmitter, let's say the received power where we measure it is PX. Is PX the same as PR? The first, the blue line, at all points in the blue line, we measure the power, the receiver, and the value is PR. And for the isotropic antenna, all points on the black line, we measure the power, and the received power is PR. Now, for the blue uh, directional antenna, transmit here, if I measure at this point, and I measure it, and the value is PX, how do you think it relates to PR? It should be more than PR. We don't know the exact value, but if I transmit with 2 watts and PR was 1 watt, okay, so I transmit here with power 2 watts, I receive here with power of 1 watt, this is closer, okay? So therefore, the value of the power at Px should be greater than Pr, it should be greater than 1 watt. It should be somewhere between 2 and 1. I don't know the value. It depends upon the distance, in free space at least. That is, the closer we are to the transmitter, the larger the received power will be. We know the power here is Pt, we know at this point it's Pr, position of the red dot, it Px, we know at least Px will be greater than Pr for this diagram, just for this example. And we also know that Px is less than Pt. It's somewhere between Pt and Pr in this diagram. How is yep. Pr isotopic? Again? How is Pr isotopic? Because Pr uh, no, uh, we've got two antennas. The black circle is the first isotropic antenna. One meter away from the isotropic antenna, I measure the power level. I get PR, e.g. one watt. Okay. Now, I now have my directional antenna, and one meter away, uh, no. At different points, I measure the received power, and at the points on the blue line, it's PR, or one watt. This may be two meters away. This is one meter away. This may be half a meter away from the transmitter because it's concentrated its energy in one direction. For the directional antenna, if we measure the power at the red point, which is one meter away from our transmitter, the measured power should be greater than PR for the directional antenna. Now we say the gain of our antenna, of our directional antenna, is the how much greater than PR? The gain of our directional antenna is if we have some value PX, and how much greater is it than PR? If PX as an example, if PT was 2 watts, PR was 1 watt, and we measured PX to be 1.7 watts. So we measure, we transmit the 2 watts, we measure for our directional antenna here to be 1 watt, 1 watt on along the blue line, but at this red point we measure the power to be 1.7 watts, less than 2 but greater than 1, 
then we say the gain of that directional antenna is the power at point x, px, divided by the power pr. In our example, 1.7 divided by 1, or simply 1.7. That is, one meter away from the transmitter, in the strongest direction, the power of our directional antenna is 1.7 times stronger than the power of our isotropic antenna. We're comparing our directional antenna against a perfect isotropic antenna. And that's the gain of our antenna. At one meter away, the power of our directional antenna is some factor stronger than the power of uh, an equivalent isotropic antenna. In this example, 1.7. Of course, if we measured in this direction, one meter away, what do you think the power measured at this point would be for our directional antenna? If I measure at this point behind the antenna, in the opposite direction, I measure the power, P, Y, for example, what do you think it will, the value will be related to the others? It will be less than PR. If we look at the blue line, start with PT, at this point the received power is PR, by definition of this is what it's showing. If we go further away, the received power will be less. At this point, it will be less than PR we can think we'd get a, a gain which is less than one in this case. Or we get a loss compared to our isotropic antenna. So the gain, when we express the gain of an antenna, what it's saying is in the point where the signal is greater, or the largest, that is where we direct the an antenna, or this signal energy, the received power is some factor larger than if we used an isotropic antenna. That's the gain of our antenna. This is expressed in an absolute value. It's a gain of 1.7. It's 1.7 times larger than the isotropic antenna. We can convert it to decibels. 10 log 1.7, whatever the value is, and multiply by 10, um, 2 point something, 2.5 dB, I just make up this number, some value here, the log of 1.7 multiplied by 10, is the gain of our antenna measured in decibels, but the notation we use is the gain of our antenna relative to an isotropic antenna. So the notation is not just dB, but dB relative to an isotropic antenna, dBi. The I means isotropic. And when you buy an antenna or look at the specification of an antenna, you will see that this is a major property. That will be a characteristic of the antenna. The maximum gain of that antenna is, say, 2.5 dBi, or it's 5 dBi. The larger the value, the stronger it will be in one particular direction. But of course, it may be very weak in another direction. But normally, if we point it in the right direction, it doesn't matter about the other direction. Before we come back to our path loss, any questions about antenna gain? It's how much stronger our real antenna is compared to a theoretical isotropic antenna. Any questions? It's all clear? Ready for the exam in, what, less than a week? I guarantee there's questions on path loss and DB and antennas.
you don't you don't need to calculate what the the gain is. It's just a matter of understanding what do we mean by antenna gain. It's normally some value that's given to you. And in fact, in real antennas, because it varies in different directions, often, and we saw some examples last week, you'll see plots that show how much stronger it is in one direction versus the other direction. But normally when you see a value of a gain is 5 dBi, it means in the strongest direction, the gain is, or the power of that antenna is larger than the isotropic antenna by 5 dB, 5 decibels. So all antennas in practice have some gain, and it varies depending upon the design of the antenna, the design and manufacture. What's the gain of the antenna on the access point? Again, we, we cannot calculate that easily. It's a specification normally. There are ways to calculate it, but we will not. Uh, it's usually, these are usually about 2 or 2.2 dBi. And similar with your laptop. The larger the antenna generally, the larger the gain that we can achieve. So, in some shops you can see you can buy longer antennas, they're about this long. You can attach them, you can unscrew these antennas on the access point and attach a longer antenna and that will give us a larger gain which means we can transmit further because with the same transmit power the receive power will be stronger. If we increase the gain, PR increases with the same loss ratio. Let's come back to our slides and get to our example of path loss. On that website we saw last week there are some examples of real antennas, their gains and plots of the antenna pattern. One antenna, one type of antenna that will, you'll commonly come across is these dish-shaped antennas. Right? There are these uh, stick-based antennas, but there are other, other types. One common type we'll see is a, a dish-shaped antenna, a parabolic antenna, like you see for satellite uh, TV reception, and you see on some uh, towers across the city or out in the country. For a parabolic antenna, and only for a parabolic antenna, not for these access point antennas, but for a parabolic antenna, uh, well, no, let's go back. This slide shows uh, how the parabolic antenna is designed, that we have some energy source, it propagates onto the antenna, and the shape of the antenna means that energy all goes in the one direction. So the parabolic antennas are used for directional, uh, highly directional transmissions usually. If you've got satellite TV at home, you need to point the dish in towards the satellite in the right direction. For all antennas, the gain of their antenna is related to the effective area of that antenna. A, E is the effective area. It's, and it's given here, 4 times pi times the effective area of the antenna divided by the wavelength squared. So we transmit a signal with some wavelength. Depending upon the area or the effective area of that antenna, we get some gain for that antenna. What is the effective area? Well, it depends upon the shape of the antenna. It depends upon the size and the shape. So the antenna here on the access point will have some effective area to, and that may be different than the antenna which is built into the screen on my uh, laptop. For a parabolic antenna, 
So the effective area uh, is often related to the physical area. In a parabolic antenna, we can normally calculate it's, for example, about a half of the physical area of the antenna. With a parabolic antenna, okay, it's close to a circle. And so you can approximate the physical area of a par parabolic antenna. If you know the size of the antenna, the diameter or the radius, if it was a perfect, if it was a flat circle, a disc, then it would be pi r squared where r is the radius. So if we calculate the area of a parabolic antenna approximately, the effective area, let's say, is a half of the physical area. This ratio varies uh, slightly. In different areas, in different types of antennas, this ratio differs. So it would need to be given to you. How can we use that? If I have a parabolic antenna, and a diameter, I won't use D, we we'll use that for distance, of one meter. So a dish about this large, uh, uh, antenna dish, one meter. What's the area of that dish? Well, it's actually a parabola. So it's not a flat disk, but if we approximate, the real area is approximately pi r squared, area of a circle. Well, the diameter is one meter, the radius is a half a meter. So the area is pi times 0 0.5 squared. That's the real area of the antenna. Now the effective area of a parabolic antenna, let's say it's a half of the real or physical area. And this half would need to be given, that is, it's a, uh, specified. So we can say the effective area, or AE, is 0 0.5 times by pi 0 0.5 squared. So the approximate effective area of our parabolic antenna is pi times a half cubed, or pi over 8. So what's the gain of this antenna? Well, we can calculate the gain of this antenna now. The gain of this antenna is 4 times pi times by the effective area, which is pi 0 0.5 cubed. 4 times pi times the effective area divided by the wavelength squared. So it depends upon, the gain depends upon the size of the antenna and the wavelength of the signal that we transmit at. One important point to note is that the larger the antenna, the larger the gain. If you want uh, to receive a good signal for satellite TV, then you can get a larger antenna. And uh, just increasing the size will increase the gain of the antenna, and that will make the received signal larger from this equation. With all other factors the same, if the gain goes up, the received power will go up. So if the satellite transmits at some power, the distance between the satellite and your house causes some path loss, L, you cannot change the gain of the satellite antenna, the satellite's up in space, but if you increase the gain of your receiving antenna, that is you increase the size of your antenna at home, GR goes up, the receive power will go up. That is you receive a signal with stronger power, and that less, gives less chance of errors. So the stronger the signal received, the better the quality of the data received. So, for any antenna, the gain is related to the effective area of the antenna, 
but also the wavelength of the signal transmitted. Recall the wavelength is related to the frequency. So if we increase the frequency of our signal, wavelength will go down and gain will go up. Increase the frequency, increase the gain in that case. Increase the area, increase the gain. So two main factors that impact upon our gain. But note, this effective area depends upon the actual antenna. With a parabolic antenna, normally we can calculate it, assuming it's the, a disk, pi r squared. With an antenna like the access point, it's harder to calculate. You need to work out what is the effective area. Now we can come back to our example. And we've started it. So we'll continue. Let's draw a diagram that shows this example. A very simple example. That the numbers are chosen to be simple. We have two antennas, parabolic antennas, each with a diameter of one metre. So this is about one metre, or at one metre here. And same with our receive antenna. For simplicity, they are the same size. They don't have to be. This could be diameter one metre, this could be a diameter of two metres. This one would therefore have a larger gain. We're transmitting a signal. And the frequency of that signal is 5 gigahertz. And we transmit with some power, PT, of 1 watt. The distance between the two antennas is 1 kilometer, or 1,000 meters. The question is, what is the receive power threshold of the receiver? The receive power threshold, what is the minimum power that the receiver uh, can receive a signal at? Normally when you buy a device, the transmit power is part of the specification. Okay? And another part of the specification of that device is the receive power threshold or sometimes the receive power sensitivity. What that means is the minimum power level that it can receive at, that it can successfully understand the signal. So if I buy a device, uh, say a wireless LAN uh, device for my laptop, a USB wireless LAN stick, and it says the receive power threshold, or sometimes you'll see uh, it's called just the sensitivity, the receive sensitivity. If it's some value, let's say uh, one nanowatt, usually quite low, what that means is if my device receives with a signal of one nanowatt or higher, it can successfully understand what was transmitted. But if it receives a signal with less, with a power of less than one nanowatt, it cannot understand it. So think of the receive power threshold or the receive sensi sensitivity is the minimum power level which your device can understand the signal. If it's less than that, it will not be able to understand the signal. It's too weak. Same as your ears have some sensitivity. That is, there's a minimum audio signal that you can uh, understand. If something's too quiet, you will not be able to hear or understand that. So there's some threshold at which if the signal receive strength is greater than the threshold, 
everything's okay. If it's less than the threshold, you will not be able to receive the data. That's usually a characteristic of a device. When you buy a device, that may be specified. It's part of the design. We want to know, in this scenario, transmit of one watt, what's the minimum power that we can, we can receive at? We want to know the value. For example, I need, to know, I need to buy an antenna for the receiver. I know it's one kilometer away from the transmitter. I know the, the size of the antenna I'm going to get. Maybe they have different receive power thresholds. I need to buy one which is low enough such I'll be able to receive the signal in this case. So let's calculate it. And we'll assume, in this case, free space path loss. So in the previous slide, we have the equation. The relationship between the transmit and receive power, the gains of the antennas, and the distance and the wavelength of the signal. It's also written on the, the right-hand side there. Actually, I'll leave it on the screen. So assuming we're in operating in, in space or in a vacuum, then what is the gain of our antenna? We'll need that. Well, in fact, we calculated it over here, because I used the same values. I said that we had a parabolic antenna, a diameter of one meter, physical area of pi times a half squared, pi times r squared. Effective area is half of that. The gain is 4 pi times by the effective area divided by lambda squared. What is lambda in our case? What is the wavelength? Lambda equals the speed of light, 3 by 10 to the 8, divided by the frequency, which is 5 gigahertz, which is 5 by 10 to the 9. So we can calculate the wavelength of our signal, which is 0 0.06 meters. So given the wavelength, I can substitute into our equation for gain and find the gain of our antenna. In our example, the transmit antenna and the receive antenna are the same. Same shape, same size. Therefore, same gain. That doesn't have to be the case. They can be different, and they'd have different gains. I just made it simpler to calculate. So the gain of our transmit antenna, following on from down there, is 4, if we simplify this, 4 times pi squared times a half, times a half, times a half, which is 1 over 8 which is, if I replace that, a half squared, a half cubed is 1 over 8. So 4 times 1 over 8 is a half pi squared divided by lambda squared on 2. Just simplifying that, what we calculated over there. And lambda is 0 0.06, so it's pi squared on 2 times 0 0.06 squared. And now I need a calculator, okay? Have I calculated it before? No. We'll leave that and find the answer later. So we can calculate the gain of our antenna. And that's the same as the receive antenna, GR, because they're the same shape and the same size, therefore same gain. So we only calculate it for one and we get the same for both. You can find the exact value. We want to know PR. We know the distance, 1,000. We know lambda, 0.06. We now know the gain of the transmit and receive antennas. 
and we know the transmit power. The free space path loss model relates all those factors together. We want to know PR and if we rearrange this equation you get the one down here. PR equals PT times GT times GR lambda squared over 4 pi d all squared. PT is 1, 1 watt, times GT, which is this value. Now we need to calculate it. And I need a calculator. Anyone have the answer? Where's my calculator? It's approximately 1,370. Approximately. 1,370. So the gain of the transmitter is 1,370, which means this antenna, one meter away from it, the receive power is 1,370 times stronger than if we used an isotropic antenna. This is not in dB. We're not using the decibel value here. It's the absolute value. So 1370 PR equals PT times GT times GR. And GR is the same, 1370 times by the lambda, the wavelength squared. Lambda squared is our 0 0.06 over 4 times pi times by the distance in meters. All squared. And now I need a calculator again. Forty two, approximately forty two micro watts. 42 by 10 to the minus 6 watts. So, what that says in this scenario, if we receive a signal with, well, if we transmit with 1 watt, we'll receive with 42 microwatts with these two antennas. If I need to go out and buy an antenna and the specification says the receive power threshold, if one antenna says the th receive power threshold is 50 microwatts, will I buy it? 50, 5 zero. If I buy the antenna specification says the receive the minimum power this antenna can receive with or this device is 50 microwatts, then that will not be good enough because I need to be able to receive a signal with 42 microwatts. So if I can buy a device which has a minimum receive sensitivity of 40 microwatts that should be enough. Or 30 microwatts, 
So the device characteristic is normally specified what's the minimum power level it can receive and understand. If my device can receive and understand anything above 40 microwatts, this will be okay. Anything above 30 and, and less will be okay. But if my device can only receive 50 and above, then we know that, at least in free space, that we need to receive 42 at least. So that would not uh, be sufficient. So that's one way we can use this analysis to work out what devices do we need? Where do we locate them in a real environment such that we can transmit our signal to be able to be understood by the receiver? Any questions on how I went through those steps? First, I counted, calculated the gain. Yeah? Let's say, just to finish, I go into a shop and I buy the antenna and the receiver, so the electronics for the receiver, and device one in the spec of the device says its minimum receive sensitivity is 40 microwatts, microwatts, and device two is 50 microwatts. What this characteristic means is this device can only receive signals, can only receive and understand signals at this power level and above. That's the minimum receive power it can understand. So we know in this environment that we need to be able to receive signals or understand signals of 42 microwatts. Device 1 can receive and understand signals of 40 and above. Device 2 of 50 and above, which is not enough to receive and understand our signal of 42. So we'd need to purchase device 1 in this case. Device 2 is not sensitive enough to receive our signal. Any other questions? You can check the calculations and do all the multiplications and so on. That's not the point here. That's again. Yes, in that direction, because the energy is concentrated in one direction. Same as when I talk. The without the microphone, the energy is stronger in this direction than in this direction. It's concentrated here. So it'll be stronger than if I talked in all directions equally. You increase it in one direction but reduce it in the other instead of spreading everywhere. So what we've covered today is so we, we know that with an isotropic antenna we transmit in all directions with a real antenna, they are directional. They concentrate their energy in a particular direction. That means that in that direction that they concentrate the energy, the power will be stronger than an isotropic antenna. And that's what we measure as the gain of that antenna. How much stronger than an isotropic antenna? The other thing we've gone through is that in free space, or in a vacuum, we have a relationship between all these factors indicating how much power we lose as we transmit our signal, L, which was 4 pi d all squared over lambda squared. Transmit with some power, transmit antenna increases it, we have a gain. We lose the power as we transmit it through the air. The receive antenna increases it again. The result is the receive power. So the relationship between these factors. Question? No, I was just asking, can we round off like that directly? Can you, ra can you round off? Uh, yeah, in some cases you can round off. Uh, I, I may round a bit too often in the, on the board because I don't have space to write down. But I think if you round off this value, 
you'll still get approximately 42, 41, 40 microwatts. In an exam, that would be okay. 43 would be okay in the exam. Yes, it depends on, you need to do rounding um, intelligently. 42.79, that's fine. I got 42, uh, you, actually yes, I got 42.8, so it should round to 43, so 43 is better. But I rounded the other one before as well, so that caused some error. That's our main coverage of wireless transmission. You need to practice some questions. You've got less than a week for the exam. There'll be questions about path loss. Look at the past exams and see the types of questions. The equations are normally given, but you need to apply the equations. We're out of time for today. Tomorrow we will, I think there's three more slides. We'll spend 10 minutes on them. And then uh, we have a small part of the next topic to, to consider. And then we'll finish in preparation for the exam.